Hi there, I'm Zach Carlson. I'm the Extension Beef Cow Specialist here at North Dakota State University. My office is located in Fargo, and today we're going to talk a little bit more about rations and nutritional management for backgrounding, specifically looking at starting rations. This webinar is part of a series of videos uh, that, that are talking about backgrounding, and I encourage you to take a look at, at our other videos to get gain different uh, perspectives on uh, backgrounding. So I think when we look at the areas of focus with these newly weaned calves, the first one is, is really location of the bunks and waters. When we think about calves kind of figuring things out within a pen, uh, really, you know, they, we know they, they circle that pen. And so placing these bunks and waters in the fence line is really going to provide a, a, a better way for those calves to identify that source. Uh, in addition to that, we need to make sure we're providing 12 inches or more of bunk space per head, and that'll allow calves to be able to get access at feed when feed is delivered. Okay, the second area then is really uh, focusing heavily on intakes and moving calves up on intake. As you think about it, we're replacing milk and grass with an, from a newly weaned calf with an energy dense diet. And it, and so when we think about that, we really need to make sure those calves are, are working their way up as a percent of their body weight on intake, because at first it's going to be quite low as they start to figure things out. And, and with that, we need to also be mindful of introducing new feeds to calves and, and, and having them build up their intake and their appetite maybe before we introduce some of those feeds. So uh, typically, the, the thought here is with fermented feeds such as haylage and silages that we introduce those slowly in this first starter period and kind of work our way into that. So as a way... Uh, uh, kind of to, to combat that as well, providing familiar feeds if, if calves had access to some of these feeds uh, before they were weaned. And so utilizing creep feed maybe in a system like this. In addition, to keep intakes increasing, and we need to think about cleaning those bunks daily for this starter period. And so that remove any of that old feed so that we're not, we're not uh, offsetting appetite or intakes uh, by molding or spoiled feeds. And then we need to provide shelter when possible uh, to protect these calves against some of the harsh environment. That, that really just means if we can provide a windbreak of sorts, being able to provide that, especially when we think about North Dakota winters and what they can bring on. We we'll also need to be mindful when there's moisture available in these pen settings, uh, how we're controlling for that and, and making sure calves have an area, a dry spot to rest. So if we think about what a starter ration or getting calves up on feed really looks like, it's it's really needs to be concentrated on that 14 to 28 days, that, that early period, you know, and that diet really should be somewhere between 50 and 70% concentrate. Now it can look different than what the calves are going to go on to after the starting ration. For instance, if we're thinking about a high forage ration, you know, and, and kind of a lower growth system to get these calves to grass, then this starter ration should really uh, be around that 50% concentrate. So still more than what that, that grower ration is going to look like, but that's because we're talking about low intakes. Get, and so every bite counts. If we think about the every mouthful counts for these calves. And so providing high energy density uh, in this diet uh, will be best to get these calves going. And so, but if we're transitioning these calves to make, say a higher concentrate ration, getting them to the feedlot, then we can we can move that starter ration to 70% concentrate. When we think about crude protein content of the diet, really needs to be at least 14%. If co-products, byproducts of, of, of are coming into the system, then we really need to uh, have, uh, you know, uh, for more than 14% is perfectly fine, uh, but but really at least 14% to meet that animal's uh, protein requirements. And we need to limit the amount of urea in the diet in the starter ration to a half percent uh, or less on a dry matter basis. And so really need to keep in mind that the protein, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, needs to be coming from plant sources and, and actually, you know, some of it being bypassed. And we'll talk we'll talk on that in just just a few slides. Again, uh, consider if your if your system utilizes creep, 
uh, using feeds similar to that creep or maybe even that creep to get these calves started. So something again familiar that they that they recognize and can can consume uh, 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 you know and get and get those intakes up. We want to keep moisture to, uh, you know, probably somewhere around 20 to 30 percent in the diet. So we don't want the diet too dry as as um, feeds can fall out, you know, in a, in a total mixed ration. But we also need to provide enough to keep that ration conditioned. So uh, somewhere in that 20 to 30 percent. As well as when we think about every bite or, or every mouthful that that calf takes, we want it to be really uniform. And so when we think about that, and if we're going to incorporate some forages into that, we need to really think about grinding and, and, and especially getting that diet mixed so that those calves can, can every mouthful is a uniform, high energy density. And so we can, we can get those calves intakes going. So I've been talking already a lot about feed intakes and, and what we should look at. And so uh, what I have basically on the left-hand side is calf weight. So five, 500 pounds all the way to 650. And so somewhere within that range, you know, uh, on the bottom is really the, the beginning uh, of the starter ration kind of progressing through those first 14 days. And uh, what I have listed here is pounds, a target pounds, of intake on a dry matter basis. So we'll operate removing that dry matter so we can, or, or the moisture so we can focus purely on, on the nutrient content and what we're providing. So in that first day, we sh our goal should be to, to get calves to be consuming about a percent of their body weight. And then as we kind of progress in that first week, you know, by the end of the week, we really hope hope we're at about a percent and a half and you can kind of see how that plays out depending on the the class and size of the animal here and then of course um in that fur and then in that second week we're really moving to 1.8 percent or they're about somewhere between one and a half and two percent and so by the end of the starter ration in that starting period we really want to be if that's 14 days want to be at two percent you know and then moving our way through at two and a half percent and kind of uh, working through that and so it's really critical to be focusing on this as we think about maybe what the diet is but particularly getting cattle to consume that diet so i wanted the this is um uh kind of a, a system that Kansas State utilizes that I, that I think really is a, an effective way to introduce cattle to, um, you know, into a starter system and, and looking at how we transition those calves in that first week. So if we look at the first seven days and really kind of how to utilize a system, uh, what Kansas State has put together is essentially um, you, you have whatever diet, grower, starter diet that you're going to utilize. Um, and and that, can, that can even be commercial feeds, uh, fit into that, fall into that category if that's something you utilize. And then we have essentially, you know, something familiar to those calves, so premium grass hay. So, um, you know, and, and essentially what we're looking at right in that first day is providing that 1% of body weight, but we're going to split it between the diet we're moving into and, and then uh, um, the, the, the long stem premium grass hay. And so really in the first three days, you can see we've, we've, we'll hold constant grass throughout this whole seven day period at a half percent body weight and then we'll slowly incrementally increase the grower starter ration uh, through those seven days but uh, over on the right hand side the feed order really in those first three days um, having uh, the ability to to essentially put the put what they're most familiar with on top that grass hay in that first three days and the diet on the bottom right and then and then basically make that switch on that on midway through the week and uh, uh, flip it and now start providing the concentrate on the, on top of the hay in the bunk. And so working through that until we get to about day seven, again, trying to work towards that 1.8% body weight or so. So I really do think this is an effective system to get calves to the bunk and, and, and working uh, on, on these intakes and, and getting them going.
This is some data from Kansas State that I think does a great job of kind of demonstrating in that first seven days uh, calf intakes based on what they're familiar with in the system. So that brown solid line is, is calves raised in a dry lot setting and they, they were provided a creep feed at about two and a half percent of their body weight. And then uh, the pasture the dashed brown line was simply calves uh, coming right off pasture, a, a native uh, pasture, and so uh, not provided any creep. And then that purple dash line is a, a combination. So calves that were out on native pasture, but had access to uh, the creep feed that the calves in the dry lot were getting um, at about 1% of their body weight. So really what I think, you know, observationally looking at this information, you can really see uh, the, the amount of calves as a percent on the y-axis as elevated in terms of, uh, of uh, calves at the bunk um, for both the, the treatments receiving creep feed. So you can kind of see what that creep feed looks like on the right hand side there. But, but um, at any rate, you know, providing something uh, a, gave those calves a familiarity within that first week and in, in getting those um, calves through uh, to the bunk and, and consuming that diet. So uh, kind of moving towards what should we be focusing on or what's your goal in terms of the entire backgrounding phase? You know, um, I think obviously your reasoning and, and what you have, your system is in place already, you know, whether you, you're anticipating trying to get a pound to a pound and a half gain all the way up to, you know, maybe three pounds is going to change depending on, you know, are you, are you trying to get your, these calves to the next grazing season? Um, are you trying to add value through a bit of preconditioning in a short, you know, backgrounding period? You know, is it developing replacement females or, uh, you know, simply marketing grains through these animals and, and, and trying to maximize that gain or, uh, you know, moving calves into uh, a finishing ration of sorts through this backgrounding period. So if we kind of look at maybe what would be considered expected gains in an ideal situation or ideal conditions, this is information in the uh, uh, nutrient uh, uh, requirements of beef cattle in the 2016. But uh, basically what we have is, is a depiction of four different rations, um, you know, really providing both, uh, you know, differences in, in TDN and, and, uh, and net energy. And if we look at really what that means on an energy system, um, kind of, and in, in looking at gains, that's really just some ballpark numbers to have, whether you look at TDN or NEG, um, but kind of depending on the gain goals and what you have, kind of gearing your diet to look, you know, something along these lines to have anticipated gains of, of their uh, over on the right hand side. So if we kind of take that and, and, and move it a little bit forward with looking at then energy and protein requirements relative to calf size. So on the left hand side here, we have calf size uh, moving from 400 pounds down to eight. And uh, um, really, you know, dry matter intake being listed there and, and um, um, you know, kind of as those calves move based on that body weight, right, that initial kind of goal, you know, of that two and a half percent or something along those lines, if we look at that. But then broken down, I have kind of the NEG, TDN, and crew protein of a pound and a half gain or two and a half pounds of gain. So you can kind of see the difference there in terms of that NEG, that energy, or, or the TDN really hasn't changed that much, right? We're, we're providing kind of that, that that energy requirement based on that calf size, and that really doesn't change all that much in the in the between those animals. And really, what the driver there is is actually the protein content, right? Real good demonstration there of you know, if, um, um, you know, low level of gain and what that crude protein diet should look like in the backgrounding phase as we move through different uh, sizes of animals. And so, so as we think about you know picking an end point and figuring out what our average daily gain should be. Um, I think it's, I think it's important to consider the equation value of gain and calculating that. 
And so how we would do that is um, say we're buying a calf to background in November. Now, if you're retaining your calves uh, from your cow calf enterprise, I think you should still um, you know, go through the, the calculation, at least on paper and looking at if you were to sell that calf and buy it back into your backgrounding system to see if your backgrounding enterprise uh, is really worth it. You, you know, and so evaluating your your calf enterprise separate from your backgrounding enterprise, at least on paper. And so, but if we do consider this, a 550 weight calf at 155, 100 weight would, would cost us $852. Okay, so in November, if we're going to put 200 pounds on that calf, we'll sell them in March. And that, and so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, target a gain of 1.6 pounds or thereabouts. So the calf we're selling in March, now these market values that I'm using are really just rounded numbers that are pretty close to averages for these months. Um, so if we sell that 750 weight calf at 145, 100 weight, that gets us about $1,087. So value of gain calculation is simply taking the, the sale price accounting for the weight to the calf minus the purchase price. So $235 uh, is, is really what the margin there is uh, for the backgrounding operation. Now we take that divided by the gain we put on that calf and that's our value of gain equation. You can match this up with cost of gain and figure out what your true margin is between the cost of gain and the value of that gain. And so uh, it's a it's a really useful tool that I think we can implement even when it comes to making decisions on on what uh, feedstuffs we go with and, and what inputs we we place on these calves and how that affects the, the margin and looking at the value of that gain based upon our, our selection of, of the energy and protein in the diet. So Really, um, what I wanted to show here is when it comes down time to select some feeds, we've talked about keeping this starter ration and keeping the, the diet that these calves start on uh, pretty high in energy and energy density. And so if we look at corn there at the top, uh, you know, crude protein, NEGs or TDN, whichever one you want to kind of focus on, you can kind of see some of the, the value in some of these uh, feeds available here in North Dakota. And uh, something I want to point out that I've said already is that you can look down here at the bottom and look at alfalfa hay and see, you know, the NEG of that alfalfa hay is, is about uh, 0.24 per megacals per pound. And so you can kind of see how uh, when we talk about really um, you know, providing higher concentrate rations, right? 50 to 70% concentrate. Really the, the result there is being, if you look across these other feeds and, and co-products and whatnot, you can see that the, the energy value difference there between. And so keeping that in mind is, as we start looking at selections of, of, of some of these components, as well as, you know, uh, the protein that maybe come from, say, distiller's grains, uh, both an energy and a, a protein um, feed. And so it really kind of fits its in a niche of its own, uh, providing uh, both both protein and energy in these diets. And so it kind of makes that uh, unique. And, and that's um, kind of to, to move into then looking at total mix rations and kind of the benefit of that. This is an older study out of South Dakota State, but uh, they basically took 72 heifers, split them, and then uh, uh, fed them over 133 days. Uh, the focus here, you can see the diet was the same between um, the, the real difference though was, was actually, you know, mixing that diet together or providing the ingredients, um, as, as individual ingredients into the bunk. And so, um, really looking at a total mixed ration and what the benefits were. And so you can see there with the mixed ration over the 133 days, those heifers actually had a, a significant improvement in average daily gain. And so this actually equated to a 10, uh, uh, 10% more gain over that 133 days, which led to 23 pounds. And so it's a, it, when you think about it in that, in that regards, um, you know, a feed mix wagon and, and the number of head you're dealing with, you know, start penciling in, uh, it, you know, whether th that investment may be worth it in, in overall, because we didn't change the diet here. It's just how we blended, mix that diet and delivered it. And so overall those, those, 
heifers in the mixed group, that TMR actually consumed 61 pounds less of feed as well in the total. So again, cost savings here when it comes to what it costed you to feed those animals and the gain that you resulted from are important things to consider even, in, you know, if, if you think uh, you're, you're a small enough operation where this couldn't pay off, I encourage you to to take a look at this and, and look at the benefits of providing a total mix ration if, if keeping calves, retaining calves and feeding them is, is something you're interested in doing. Okay, so talking about energy content of these uh, uh, starter rations, there's a there's a really good study done back in the 90s, Fluhardy and Lurch, uh, looking. This was a 28 day starter uh, trial uh, using 60 steers. So these these calves weighed at the beginning uh, 467 pounds. So on the left here, I, the graph is the dry matter intake of those animals over that 28 day period. And so you can see the diet listed across, um, uh, simply put, you know, moving from a 52 NEG diet up to a 59 NEG, simply by displacing corn silage uh, with corn. Uh, and so the protein source there being soybean meal and blood meal, of course, blood meal wouldn't wouldn't be something uh, we'd find common anymore, of course, but but nonetheless, you know, providing a protein, a concentrate, and then corn silage, of course, being that blend of both forage and concentrate, accounting for the corn that's delivered there. At any rate, what they saw with the this 28-day trial was that as you increased um, energy content, the purple line being that 59 NEG diet, and then the, the green line being next at 57 NEG. So basically, as you increased the energy content of, of the starter rations, they saw an improvement in, in dry matter intake in week three and week four. So, um, you know, you can kind of, that kind of comes through on, uh, on average daily gain there um, over, you know, as you increase the energy content of these starter rations and so although uh you know um, um the numerical differences there and feed efficiency uh it took a little bit more feed um uh per, to put on a pound of gain uh at those higher energy levels that but uh, uh most likely that's just probably a difference in in gut fill on those but you can kind of see as you move through um uh, they the results there you know in terms of increasing energy content and the incidence of morbidity in sick calves really did, wasn't there as they increase the energy content so so if we transition then and look at uh, protein sources um, I think it's important to to note that not all protein is the same. So when we think of crude protein, we can see those values there for the respective feeds. Uh, you see urea, urea is at 281 uh, relative to some of the other feeds, alfalfa, hay, distillers grains, and that really is is. Uh, 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 but but that protein, that crude protein, isn't all uh, the same in terms of how it's degraded within the rumen. So there's a fraction of that protein that will be degraded, and that is uh, noted as rumen degradable protein there in that middle column. And then there's the fraction that uh, is often called bypass protein, and which avoids rumen degradation. And so rumen undegraded protein. As you can see, urea is 100% rumen degradable protein, as it is a primary source of nitrogen, or or is a source of nitrogen for the microbial population only. And so uh, when we look at, say, alfalfa hay, that has a fairly high level of rumen degradable protein, but still provides some level of rumen undegradable protein. Distiller's grains has the opposite degradation. So uh, pr that's a primarily, uh, the protein is primarily bypass protein. And so that makes it a little bit unique relative to some of the other feeds and where uh, most of that protein can actually go towards the animal's growth requirements and the animal can use that protein. So uh, this slide depicts really a great uh, representation of the value that I've been just talking about with the uh, value of distiller's grain. So it was a pooled analysis of four growing studies that uh, done in Nebraska and the base of the diet was grass, hay, and sorghum silage, so forage-based diet. And they looked at, you know, kind of having similar performance 
between dry rolled corn and distillers and really what those inclusion levels look like. So you can see dry rolled corn at 36% of that diet versus 23% for the wet distillers grains. And overall, really pretty similar uh, performance, same dry matter intake, uh, average day of the gain, maybe a little bump towards the distillers grains and a little improvement in feed efficiency for that as well. But but nonetheless, pretty similar performance, but that distillers grains only needed to be included at, uh, you know, 13% less of the diet to get similar performance. So really, uh, I think this does a, a great job of, of sh showing the, the energy value that we can get from providing the, the high protein, but also highly digestible distillers grains relative to dry rolled corn and so when you think about pricing distillers grains and dry rolled corn you know comparing those they often uh, distillers is priced as a uh, kind of on a percent of of what the the price of corn is um, there's really a lot of movement in in being able to go you know 120 percent 130 percent the value of the dry rolled corn because we can see that value uh, through through feeding less distillers grains feeding in situation so um kind of wanted to look then at you know differences there's a really good study looking at uh, you know difference between room and degrade abilities essentially in growing rations so the first diet there being a 100 percent room and degradable protein right urea and, and these were in um, high corn silage growing diet so 79 percent of the diet was was corn silage and so we look at basically yeah uh, highly degradable versus soybean meal would be mostly rumen degradable protein around 70% um, with 30% being rumen undegraded and then kind of the inverse there being for distillers grains having about 30% uh, 36% uh, rumen uh, degradable protein and about 63% rumen undegradable protein and so looking at these diets they're they're pretty similar in crude protein overall but again different sources of that protein and what what the end result being here and just demonstrating that uh you know as we provide uh, a source of rumen undegradable protein we see that improvement over the the urea treatment that that 100% rumen degradable source and so we can see the the bump in average daily gain and the improvement in feed efficiency when we're providing some protein that the animal has direct access to that being that bypass protein so if we transition now and look at ionophores and talk about those a little bit when we look at ionophores and growing rations we can improve average daily gain by five to fifteen percent and improve feed efficiency by eight to twelve percent and this is simply a function of altering the microbial population uh, in the rumen uh, due to the nature of ion four being an antibiotic and uh, a lot actually increasing the amount of energy available uh, through basically the selection Selection of what microbes are fermenting those feeds and so uh, this really overall has a result with the improved performance on uh, about a one and a half percent uh, improvement on your break-evens and uh, so if we look the survey Zoetis put out this year uh, national Sur uh, stalker survey uh, those that feed iron fours is over half and so there's still uh, some that 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 opt not to use it and but i encourage you know um, um, for you to look at your own operation and consider the improvements that you may see through the use of an ionophore some data to look at ionophores um, here done by uh, Lambloom and others is uh, you know some old data but uh, looking at uh, five and a half weight calves and uh, um, simply you know getting uh, looking at a control diet without ion fours and then both Bovitech and Rumensin being ion fours there and what they saw was in uh, in a diet that was you know primarily barley and grass hay with a little bit of alfalfa in a protein supplement there that uh, they saw an improvement in 11 and a half percent from the control with Bovitech inclusion and uh, 15 and a half uh, excuse me, 15% improvement with Fermentin. And so both, again, improving that feed efficiency mark and, and overall average daily gain, uh, kind of just demonstrating that improvement. I'm going to transition and wrap up here with looking at a little bit of, uh, you know, corn processing and grower rations. And so if we think about uh, um, kind of 
keeping you know processing that corn rolled corn in a, in a diet and and is it worth you know kind of that that cost associated with it and the and the labor um, when we talk about growing rations particularly and growing rations with some corn byproducts in them so in this case this study was done here out in Carrington looking at 25 percent corn 27 uh, percent distilled grains 26 percent silage and some wheat straw and uh, essentially those calves uh, that uh, uh, kind of a Again, NEG diets very similar at that 50 NEG. Uh, over the course of 60 days, um, though they were uh, uh, six and a half weights. Uh, looking at the results here now, um, the was really no difference at all actually in 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 calf performance between those. So in this case, when we're talking about diets with some dis, uh, distillers grains, but but corn byproducts in there. And uh, you know, inclusion levels in a forage-based diet here, a background and ration, um, there, there doesn't appear to be, and this is backed by several other uh, studies across different universities, doesn't seem to be an improvement in performance in these grower rations by processing that corn. So something to consider in your operation. I wanna thank you all for tuning into this video and encourage you to take a look at our other videos within this series, uh, focusing on backgrounding. If you have any questions or would like to further discuss backgrounding or any topic related to beef cattle in North Dakota, uh, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. Thank you.